Um, so firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who's um, made the time to attend today's briefing. As I mentioned before, I appreciate that not everyone uh, who would have liked to attend is able to. Uh, so we are recording today's session and it will be available on Dairy Hub uh, after the, the briefing. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we meet today. I'm coming from Wurundjeri country, uh, oh sorry, uh, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation uh, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so weather is always topical with our farmers. Um, we're seeing frequent media reports at the moment about the approaching summer and heightened concern about the return of El Nino, and that's being reflected in some of the trends that we are seeing on farm. Uh, so to provide us with greater insight on the coming season, I'd like to welcome uh, Alistair Hawksford from the Bureau of Meteorology, who is providing today's briefing. Alistair is the Agricultural Team Leader within the Agriculture and Water Program uh, Business Solutions Group at the Bureau. Uh, so I will now hand over to Alistair to uh, kick us off. Thanks, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning for those in the West. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Yuggera country uh, up around uh, Brisbane. And um, uh, yeah, as uh, Rachel mentioned, I'm currently the agriculture team leader and I've, I've been at the Bureau now for nearly 10 years and uh, really promoting uh, the, to the Bureau how much uh, value can be generated uh, by doing things a little bit differently and providing products and services that are really tailored to the decisions that are made by the ag sector um, for, I've been doing that for six, seven years now. And um, uh, originally from a sheep farm outside of Armidale, New South Wales, and um, uh, trained as a climatologist uh, in Brizzy. So uh, yeah, bringing those two together has uh, always been a passion. and uh, it's, it's a good spot, good spot to be. So look, um, yeah, thanks for offering some time today out of your days and um, uh, I'll, uh, I do have my colleague here, Rachel Davis, who's part of the Ag team as well. And um, uh, Rachel, very kindly uh, keep an eye on the the chat if anyone wants to throw questions in, um, and um, uh, just be an extra set of eyes and ears if any hands go up. So on that, I, I am really keen for this to be a two way conversation. Um, so please um, uh, feel free to. Um, interject, ask questions anywhere along the uh, conversation. And um, I'll do my best if I think we, we are dragging it out a bit too much, we're not going to make time. I will uh, just maybe park some questions and we'll move on. So without further ado, let's uh, get cracking. Um, so we want to have a look at the long range forecast uh, for uh, dairy uh, producers. And um, so this, here's roughly how I'm going to uh, break this down uh, with our smiling team of uh, the ag team there on the right. We'll start with a little bit of commentary about El Nino. What is it and why shouldn't we listen to it? Um, then we're going to have a look at the outlook for summer, uh, have a bit of a conversation around that. And if we've got some time, we've got a couple of other tips for um, decision makers in there. All right. So I'm sure all of you here are across the nuts and bolts, but I, so I will just do the, um, the high level version of, you know, what is El Nino? Well, well, it's actually the El Nino Southern Oscillation, so ENZO, and it's essentially just a measure of uh, temperatures of the sea surface temperature in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, and then the response that you get in the atmosphere to those temperatures. So uh, you see there on the right, um, if you've got warmer water uh, near Australia, that creates lift in the atmosphere and draws in the trade winds across the Pacific, which in turn brings moist air, which falls as rain more often than usual. Uh, so that's what happens in a La Nina and in El Nino, that is reversed. So we have cooler waters, which draws air down and uh, uh, slows down the development of rainfall. So look, it is a statistical relationship. Um, so by that I mean we've looked back through time and gone, well, we have records of the sea surface temperatures and of rainfall, and we can see a correlation between the two. 
but it is statistical. So it 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 relies on being an average of that time that you you looked at in the past. Mm. And that'll be an important point as we move forward here. Um, so zooming out one step further, there are actually many drivers of climate in Australia. Uh, it's it's a, a busy space. Um, and so Enzo is just one of them. Yes, granted, it is the most influential of them, but it is still just one. And so there are four main ones, arguably five, um, but you know, draw the line where you'd like. Uh, and so you would have heard of Enzo, uh, which we're focusing on today, but also the Indian Ocean Dipole, Southern Annular Mode, Mount Julian Oscillation, and the one which I argue is a fifth one is the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. Um, now they all interact together in different ways. They all have different phases, which are sometimes influenced by others and sometimes aren't. And so if we just took the most basic view of Australia's climate drivers and said there's four of them, um, well, each driver has at least three phases. So you multiply it out and very quickly, you've got a huge variety of potential combinations of this one being wet, that one being dry, that one being neutral. And so it it's a, it's a really complex interaction of all of those things, which actually drives the weather, the shorter term actual impact stuff that we see on the ground in Australia. Um, so I'll just to delve into that a bit more, you know, so this is about that statistical forecasting approach. And um, as I mentioned, there are so many different combinations. So here's just a few examples where you might, the question that we're asking for the, to help us make decisions on the ground is how much rain am I going to get? And if you wanted to answer that using a statistical climatology uh, model, so um, you know, using ENSO and IOD and the, the rest, you'd have to go, right, well, what phase is it in? What phase is the Indian Ocean Dipole? What phase is SAM? What phase is the MJO? What phase is all the rest? And then try to work out how do they combine with each other? How do they interact? Okay, so if you work that out, that was my uh, thesis at uni. It takes a lot of work. <laughs> Trying to do that every day would be a really big undertaking. But then you've got to think about, OK, well, how much influence does that driver have for this particular location? And so the majority of the time focuses its um, influence on the southeast of Australia. Um, and Julian oscillations right across the north. So, you know, how much, what percentage of those is actually going to affect your climate? That's a complex question of itself. And then, of course, how much has climate change affected that statistical relationship? So these relationships only hold if we have a stable climate. And it's quite clear that we don't have a stable climate. It is changing. So as time goes on, these metrics become less and less reliable. So here's the punchline. It's bloody complex if you're trying to make a decision based off climate drivers when actually the decision we're trying to make is based off how much rain we're going to get and we're, we've got a bit of a disservice happening at the minute where uh, in particular the media uh, is is really looking at well it's good clickbait to talk about el nino um, um or la nina and and that just gets everyone talking about this and it's actually only one very small piece of the puzzle so we need to be very careful about making decisions based on the probability of it being El Nino. The dynamical forecast approach. So this is the alternative to using a statistical approach. This is where we have some supercomputers that take into account all of the billions of observations that we get from across the world, mash them all together to get an idea of what, what does the planet look like right now? What are the conditions at all parts of the globe? And then use physics to just push that into the future multiple times and see where it ends up. So 
I like to think of this as having a hundred basketballs at the top of a hill. So each basketball represents a particular forecast. And if you roll that basketball down the hill with, to your knowledge, the exact same approach, you are always going to get very minor perturbations. It's going to go, it's going to bounce slightly differently off that bit of grass or that rock, or um, that one was slightly faster. And in the end, well, I should say in the short term, that forecast, so over a couple of meters is going to be pretty reliable. You'll know that it's going to be within a couple of centimeters of that path that you sent it on. But as you go further into the future, you know, you're asking questions like, what, how many of those hundred basketballs ended up next to the creek and how many ended up on the other side of that little knoll at the bottom? And that's actually how our dynamical forecasts work. All these minor perturbations and chaos theory being introduced actually introduces variation. And then at the end of the hundred forecasts, you can count 72 of them were in the wet zone, 15 were in the dry zone. And that's that's actually how dynamical forecasts work. Really important point, taking this approach means you are already capturing all of the climate drivers, plus any climate drivers that we haven't discovered yet, because it looks at the entire planet all in one go. So, punchline of this first bit is trust the outlook don't trust the driver all right if you're making decisions don't just think about is it going to be el nino actually ask the question is it going to be dry because we have that information and it's more skillful it's more accurate than just thinking about that climate driver so that was the first thing I wanted to cover. Is there any questions on that? I, I've got a question. Um, so if you, so say of your hundred balls rolling down the hill, then I presume you're just using a hundred like a number. It's probably thousands of impressions is it that you take. Do you just purely then go on proper, so if you've got like 75, say dry, you go dry? Or like, how do you then interpolate between these multiple different paths that you're produce? Like what, because they, if they're different, then how do you pick a, is it just on quantity or, you know, tell me yeah, a bit about Yeah, good question, that. Claire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've oversimplified that metaphor potentially. <laughs> I thought you may have, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's illustrative. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, the, the idea is that um, if you had 75 on one side and 25 on the dry side, then you could say 75% chance of it being wet, 25% of it being dry. Um, but of course, those basketballs are going to be in a, in a row all the way down along the bottom of the hill. So you can take a pick and say, well, my threshold is that. So how many balls are to the right of that point? Um, so there's a whole heap of ways that you can interpret that. And we're actually going to look at that in real time with this forecast. So hold on to that concept. And if we haven't answered it, um, we can come back to it at the end. Thanks. No worries. The other bit that I, I should say is that this is how uh, so the Bureau's model, a uh, seasonal model is called XSS. So that's how this works. And it actually is 100 uh, forecast runs, uh, ensemble members, if you want to be technical. Um, but uh, other forecasting uh, countries around the globe will have their own seasonal models and uh, they will be available. They are available to us as well uh, through a range of different resources and um, they will have different numbers of model runs and they'll go out to different lengths and that, but the most importantly they are tuned for their country yeah uh, now each model has to generate a forecast for the whole globe or else you can't forecast for your area but the tuning is different on each of them so the european model is tuned to be accurate for europe not necessarily us the us the same thing japan but what we 
do internally, our climatologists will look at all of them and go, all right, well, our model said this, how different is that to everyone else? Which is essentially a super ensemble, but I'm getting too deep in the weeds now, but just to let you know that we are looking at everyone across the, the globe in terms of what does everyone else think to help us determine how much confidence can we have in the forecast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if any other questions pop up along the way, um, we're, uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end, but I'll I'll get into the more juicy stuff. That was more the prelude. So let's start to have a look at the um, forecasts. And so I've I've done a um, rough breakdown of the uh, dairy regions. Uh, so forgive me that I've aggregated some. Um, I thought a page for each of the eight might leave us here until too late. Um, so forgive me if I've overdone that and we can talk. But first of all, let's look at the um, subtropical um, region. Um, so here's the um, uh, map that we're all familiar with. It's the one that gets all the airtime. Um, it's just the chance of being above or below um, average or median uh, rainfall. So looking, this is as far out as our public products go, no November to January. Uh, so best look at uh, summer, early summer. Um, and it is for this region uh, a greater chance of being below median rainfall. Now, it's worth thinking about this. That doesn't distinguish whether that means it's going to be 49% of your normal rainfall or 5% of your normal rainfall. It just says, uh, let's take a pick this yellow color for uh, 35 to 40 percent um, of the balls are on the wet side and uh, 65 to 60 percent are on the dry side okay so there are actually more helpful tools to have a look at and so here's one if you're not aware of it this one is the chance of um, being unusually dry so it's in the driest 20 percent of historical records um, and um, I've I wanted to point out October to December because there is a clear um, uh, signal here where there is a, a elevated chance that it will be in that unusually dry um, um, conditions uh, and so if you have a look here, there are a few brown spots where it's up to three times more likely that will be uh, in the bottom 20% of records. So I think in terms of answering that question of how much rain are we going to get, this goes a good step forward to being, well, we're not just talking about below average here, we're talking about quite dry. Doesn't guarantee it though. So let's have a look in a bit more detail here. So I picked a few spots, Atherton, Toowoomba and Kempsey. Um, again, sorry if they're not quite spot on for everyone, but it's just, this is illustrative and all of this is available on the on our website. So you can pick anywhere. Um, if we look at Atherton, here's a five month forecast split into individual months. Um, now the way to read this, I'm gonna show a lot of these. So I'll just um, give you a moment to digest. The background colours are the historical range. So if, if, if we look at November, the wettest it's been at Atherton in November on record is 260. And the driest has been, well, it's non-zero, call it five mils for November at Atherton. So these bands tell you this, the red, is unusually dry, the yellow is dry, the white is average, green is wetter, and blue is unusually wet. So it's 20% increments. So that's the historical, that's what the backdrop is. The forecast right now is the box and whisker plot. So that shows us, and we've, we've got the dotted line going through the most probable um, outcome. But think about the range. So the box is a 25% and 75%. So uh, that suggests that 50% uh, of the basketballs, the forecast runs, have landed in that box. 
All right, so it gives you an idea of how sure we are that it's going to be either wetter than usual, drier than usual, or in the middle. So in this case for Atherton, um, it is running through the dry uh, to average um, sort of space, uh, but there is a lot of variance once we get into January. So the forecasts are anywhere from very wet to very dry, but with a focus in and around that average. If we look at Toowoomba, um, it's it's a similar type of pattern, uh, but that spread is a li little bit wider earlier on. So that's something to think about. That just think of the, I, th I think the easiest thing to do is look at the box. Um, if you really need rainfall in November, well, the chances are it'll be somewhere between slightly wetter than average, but fairly dry. So it gives you, a, again, a bit of an inkling that it's going to be on the drier side. And then Kempsey, um, uh, again, a similar picture. So right across this east coast, uh, we do have um, a signal that is probably on the drier side, but um, uh, there is still a bit of variance in the forecast. So our confidence um, is moderate overall. Um, look, it's lower in the confidence is also lower in the south, I should say. Yeah, so Kempsey, it is broader range of outcomes there. Plus our past accuracy, which is these um, stars at above. In the past, it's been correct less times. So if you've got less stars, that forecast has been correct less often. Right. So they're the things that you can look at to go, well, how confident can I be in this forecast if I'm making a decision? So you go, so the, the, the wrap up for subtropical is probably more to look at this um, uh, chance of unusually dry between October to December and really uh, keep that in mind. Do we have anyone from the subtropical regions that want to ask a question? So give it six seconds. So if you come up with one later, feel free to ask later. We'll move on to New South Wales. Um, so again, I'll, I'll do the same format uh, through each of the regions. So if we look at um, the outlook for November to January, it, it's pretty benign. You know, there's a, a chance of um, uh, average conditions is, is the most likely outcome for November to January now. But that being said, if you look at October to December, we do have again elevated chances of unusually dry conditions. So um, this is the one that we want to be thinking about. Um, well, what are our options if that comes to light? Because the chance of that happening is increasing. Uh, so, you know, destocking or um, whatever it might be, get it, getting access to feed. Um, I know that that's, there's ch market challenges with both of those things at the minute, but it is something that the, the outlook is suggesting um, we, sh we should be thinking about. So uh, for this region, I looked at uh, Scone, Orange and Bega. And again, please, anyone interrupt if you'd like to pick it apart a bit. Uh, so looking at Scone, um, it is it is quite dry at the minute. I mean, that's no surprise to anyone. Um, uh, the Hunter is, uh, you know, very dry states um, and coming. So the rain to pull it out of there would need to be significant. So I think this is the bit where it's a slightly different story. We know it's very dry there. So you'd need quite a bit of rain to bring it back to where it needs to be. Uh, and we're not seeing a high likelihood of that happening. We're actually seeing for the next few months still uh, more likely than not that it'll be below average or in the dry zone. December, there's a bit of a peak there, but I'll just caution um, being too optimistic around it because there is a large spread, so a lot of different potential outcomes, plus the past accuracy isn't crash hot 
for this time of year, that location at that lead time. So just a little bit of caution and um, optimism there. Looking over at Orange, so just to get a bit of a spread out further west, um, similar story. We're in it. We're in a dip, and a dip's likely to persist um, out until January. Uh, but January's uh, still looking to be um, average um, at best. And Bega, Bega's a slightly better story, looking more on the um, uh, average side of life. But um, uh, you know, if if anything, on on the slightly dry side. The confidence is the thing to really keep in mind with these. Uh, it's the Central West has got higher confidence, so it's a lower um, range, and the past accuracy is slightly better. Um, so, yeah, like it, the the clearer signal for me is is again looking at this chance of unusually dry, um, particularly out in Orange. It's it's getting into those darker yellows, so two times more likely. Um, which suggests you know you'd want to be getting ready uh, for that potential outcome. Rach. Uh, yeah, thanks, Al. Um, this is all very informative. I always enjoy hearing you um, talk and explain things. Um, I was uh, just wanted to add last week, I was um, or this week rather, I was up in Cairns um, for a Northern Australia conference, and um, yeah, we talked a lot about these climate outlooks and. Um, and the you know drivers and influences behind them. Uh, it, what happened more recently, a couple of months ago, was there was just like one, like one significant rainfall event on one day that <clears throat> completely changed the outlook. And it didn't it didn't change, um, I guess the you know unusually dry um, outlook. But that was just one day, um, yeah, changed the rainfall for a whole. A whole month of averages. So, um, yeah, I just sort of wanted to reiterate what you what you talked about and how um, you know these are our best um, best guide at, at this time. But yeah, some sometimes just one one rainfall event can completely uh, change anything. So mm. yeah. yeah, it's a good point, and it does does raise um, uh, the other element to this is that these forecasts, unfortunately, in this form don't give us information about whether it is going to come in one event and just run straight off or whether it's going to be nice soaking rain, which we're going to get a pasture response out of. So unfortunately, it doesn't have that level of detail. Uh, we do have a team of tame meteorologists, climatologists that are providing some decision support, um, but um, I'll, I'll cover that a bit later. And um, yeah. All right. Uh, so that's New South Wales. Were there any questions about New South Wales? All right. Good. Um, here's where I might get slapped. I, I, I grouped Murray, Gippsland, West Vic, SA and TAS all together. Um, so um, again, apologies if that, that's a bit, I've taken too much liberty. But uh, look, for this region, we've got a similar signal, which is why I, I think it was actually um, a, a reasonable look at things. Um, again, chance of uh, above median is uh, low. Um, so across most of the region, we've got this uh, clear signal that it is going to be lower than normal. Um, but the October to December, again, is the same uh, clearer signal where um, we do have elevated chances of unusually dry conditions um, and quite a bit elevated. So I think down around uh, the southern parts of Vic and southern parts of SA, western part of Hobart, uh, Hobart of Tasmania, we're in the two and a half times more likely to be in that bottom 20% of rainfall records. So that that is a, a much clearer um, signal. The other thing that gives me confidence in that signal is that it's not just a it's not a bullseye somewhere. It's actually for that whole region. So the these forecasts are at 5K resolution. And when you zoom out like this and see the whole area in that colour, that gives you, again, gives you some confidence. Um, so I've looked at Echuca, Del Deloraine and Mount Barker. Um, so 
Echuca. Um, September's uh, expected to be dry. I mean, you, you look at that, 50% of the forecasts are in that um, uh, dry or very dry zone. Um, and uh, October's not much better. We start to get a fair bit of spread into November uh, uh, where we're looking at, well, it could be anywhere from wet to very dry. Um, but I think the, the bit, so I'm losing confidence once we look past November, but it's still fairly reasonably consistent all the way through. Sorry, um, showing that, um, yeah, not likely to be a big change. So that's, uh, it's, reflective i think of the the map below as well uh deloraine very similar story uh running through the uh dry um zone the yellow zone here uh not much tipping into the uh wet or very wet zones like only out here in january where we're starting to see something pop up but at that range um, with that much variability and only one star and their past accuracy, uh, I think I'd be exercising caution on being too optimistic about January. Um, so again, uh, Deloraine's uh, looking looking to be drier than usual over the uh, summer. Mount Barker, uh, same sort of conversation. So I think this is why I was um, happy to group this together. Um, Happy's maybe the wrong word, content grouping them together, but um, it does look like we've got a dry outlook for the whole um, region. Um, so just in terms of confidence, I've mentioned it before, just keep in mind those forecast ranges um, and, um, and the past accuracy stars. Any questions from our folk in the south? I will recognise that this is complex, uh, as so it's not easy to communicate, let alone interpret. So we really would love any feedback that you have as well. Uh, and if that feedback is harsh, great. So don't don't feel like you need to hold back. We really do want to learn and get this right. Um, but I'll, I'll keep uh, chuffing on. Um, so last one is looking out in the west uh, in WA. We've got uh, again a, a dry signal for November to January, so that's our, as far out as the models looking. Um, looking at unusually dry conditions, uh, they're elevated as well. Um, and to that point I made before, looking at the whole region, which gives us some extra confidence that um, this isn't just a, a blip in the system. Um, there are some subtle differences. So I looked at uh, uh, Mandurah and Albany. Um, uh, so <laughs> September's fairly average. I mean, it is in it, the the most likely outcome is in the slightly drier than normal. Uh, but October's starting to drop off. November. The thing is, at this time of year. Um, it's not unexpected to be dry, so we also need to think about that. Um, but that's where the background um, be really helpful, um, just to understand. Well, historically, this is what it looks like. So, how does that play out um, for for your livestock? You know, do you actually need uh, a bit more rain, uh, or are you, are you sitting pretty and you're, you're pretty happy to leave it to dry off, hay off? Albany um, is it's much tighter. Uh, you, you'll notice that you'll see that the the variability in those forecasts is much lower, uh, which gives you confidence that it is going to be within these rainfall ranges. But the other thing to think about is that part of the world it is very consistent. Uh, so you look historically, it's also much tighter. So. Um, we're not seeing a huge amount of difference for Albany. So again, I'll come back to the key point here being this chance of drier than um, usual or unusually dry, I should say. There's a clear signal there that um, it, it, we should be preparing for that scenario. And we've just talked about confidence there. So any questions from the West? Okay. 
Um, I didn't have a slide in here on this, but it, it's just occurred to me to, to say that while these forecasts, our, our uh, forecast models only look out six months, um, it, it's for good reason. Uh, beyond that, you start to get into the realm of um, uh, thinking about climatology. So you get back into uh, trying to use those statistical um, uh, forecasting methods, which does make it tricky to, to communicate. But I think the overall uh, comment here is that um, there, there's a increased chance that that dry will continue. Um, just looking historically, um, uh, the way that these normally play out is that you get a season, uh, a dry season following a, a dry season um, before it starts to swing around. Now, of course, that's no guarantee, and of course, we've seen the other. Um, a version of that, uh, but if we just wanted to play the odds, um, it, it is looking uh, drier in the longer term. And that, that's how that's how we need to use these forecasts. Uh, these are not about being specific or definite. It's that's just not possible. Um, uh, I, I use the analogy about going to the casino. If you knew that the casino was going to pay out. 51% of every bet, well, you'd, you'd still go to the casino, but you wouldn't throw your entire mortgage down on the first hand. You'd slowly drip it in all night on, on low, um, uh, low amounts, and you'd be bloody rich by the end of it because you know that overall you're going to win. And these, this, this is how we need to be using our forecasts, our long-range forecasts. What subtle tweaks can we make in our decision making to lean toward a higher chance of dry or um and so in that sense over the long term you'll you'll win out all right doing well for time so i will um i will go into just these other bits and pieces a couple of tips and tools um uh, though I'm, I'm happy to be guided by folk in the room. If you've had, all of a sudden had a brainwave, please sing out. The first point I want to make is not many people are aware that we actually have um, information from 100 years back in the past all the way out to six months for your farm, for every farm across the country. There's a, there's a lot of people that uh, think it's just for spots where there's an automatic weather station, and that's just not the case. Um, so there are tools up there right now which you can have a look at, and uh, here are the three main ones. Uh, so this is the Australian Water Outlook, uh, and this has uh, historical data back for 100 years for your location. And you can see down the bottom here um, how that those observations have changed um, over the last year, and pick your year, you can have a look. No worries. Um, so that, that's a really helpful resource. The other thing that's good about it is you can look at soil moisture or evapotranspiration. So encourage you if you haven't had a look, have a look at that. And again, happy to receive feedback on it. Seven day forecasts. Um, there are forecasts again for every uh, farm across the country, a six kilometre resolution. So if you haven't looked at MedEye, have a look. Um, the, the Bureau's app uh, is run off the same data as this, uh, and so you don't have to be, you know, the closest town who's 30 k's away. You can actually have it for your farm, so just keep that in mind. And um, uh, as you've seen today, the climate outlooks, so the, the long-range forecasts, they are specific to any location. Um, so I think in all of these examples I've picked, our family farm out near Kentucky. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I promise it works for anywhere. <laughs> uh, things that are on the horizon, so upcoming ones. So the Climate Service for Agriculture program, um, which has just been renamed, and forgive me for not having done that, um, uh, it uh, is providing the um, so it's called My Climate View, and it provides projections data. So what's going to happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, but using your location 
and using your commodity. So I whipped in there this morning and just went, all right, well, show me heat stress at Vega. So this is cattle, dairy cattle heat stress at Vega over the coming decades. So uh, this is a really helpful tool to start having a look at if you're uh, thinking about well, what's my business model and does it need to change? Um, what might impact me in the longer term? Uh, so that's that's already there. So if you search my climate view or we can send through the links to Rachel and distribute them, um, please have a look and have a play um, that because that is still being actively developed. So uh, any feedback you provide now will really help to um, affect the final outcome. The other one is Agriclimate Outlooks. So it's a partnership with Agriculture Innovation Australia. And that's where we're trying to do this same commodity decision focused work, but for um, uh, the long range forecast. So what's happening over the next few weeks, months or seasons, uh, which is essentially what I've delivered for you today is a decision support service. Um, uh, now, there are folk in the decision support team who are way smarter than I am, <laughs> but the, they're um, flat out delivering to our other investors uh, for that project. Um, and uh, you'll you see them here. Um, uh, in fact, I think they've just been on coming back from a tour out in the West. Um, so um, it's it's something to think about if, if, if you're seeing value in having these types of conversations and being able to regularly have them so that you can inform other producers in your region, then um, this is uh, a project which is ripe for uh, leverage. And with that, I think we hit the end. So, questions, thoughts, feelings? Alyssa, g'day. Alistair, how are you? Thank Good, you. Good, thanks. That yeah. was great. Um, I don't have a question. I guess I just wanted to opportunistically um, let all the DA staff know um, that um, myself and my fabulous pre predecessor, Alison, have been working on a lot of the bomb projects, providing some input into some of this stuff. Um, and some of them I found really exciting. So I guess just a reminder to let you all know that the now now new available and far easier to find on our website links to the um, so number one, the website contains links to these products from the bomb so that, um, staff and farmers can go and access these kind of long range and extreme weather forecasting uh, products and figure out what's happening in their neck of the woods. We also have um, the links and some activities set up in our climate risk online learning modules for both the, I'm going to use all the old product names, Alistair, and I'm sorry <laughs> you can okay. correct me. Um, but the forewarned is forearmed product, which is about extreme weather forecasting. So what are my chances in the next few days of weeks of getting, you know, potentially flooded or having some major heat stress event? Um, and also the product that Alistair was talking about, the climate services for agriculture, that long term outlook. Um, and also, I can't see Nat on the call, but I can see Libby. So Libby, jump in if I get this information wrong. Um, we are also in the process of organising um, a bit of a training event for relevant, for or for interested, I should say, not relevant, DA staff on that um, extreme weather forecasting suite of products. Um, so thanks, Alistair. I didn't have a question. I just had a <laughs> just had a plug. Perfect plug. Love it. No worries, Alyssa. Any other thoughts? Now it can't have been that crystal clear. I'm I'm not that good. Right. I guess as a prompt I, i'm interested to know i guess what people are sort of 
are sort of thinking now when they see like after that presentation or during that presentation when they might see a drier, unusually dry outlook for their area or, or um, you know, any sort of key takeaways or, or actions that they might sort of take now after um, hear, hearing a, a little bit about that potential outlook. So as a prompt, if anyone um, wants to take themselves off mute. <clears throat> I guess my my first. So thank you for the presentation. Um, for someone who's based in New South Wales, it's it's not the news that I, I wanted, um, but um, I'm glad to have it. Um, I, I guess the um, I'm curious as to how far the crystal ball goes, right? So um, I guess the the sort of the really longer term. Future and, and apologies if if some of this was discussed at the start. I, I sort of missed the first five minutes, um, but um, you know the information is fascinating and certainly information we can make sure dairy farmers are aware of. But I, I guess um, you know the, the the question always is, well, well, how long am I preparing for, right? Um, and um, you know, is there any any thoughts on sort of longer term trends? Uh, look, not that I can give you with any certainty beyond the, the comment I made before that look there's a if you look historically these sorts of events do go back to back um, so don't, they don't generally happen in isolation a, a really dry period that being said there have absolutely been dry periods which were once offs um, and the reliability of looking backwards in order to look forwards is dropping so it's it's a really tough one to say, Paul, but um, certainly it's uh, trying to find ways to drive our forecasts out further to start to answer that question is um, something we're trying to do. Is there a particular decision that you're thinking of that would that would help inform? Um, Yeah, that's a so you know a, the obvious sort of conversations we're going to start having with people are around feed budgeting, uh, number of animals that they carry, um, you know what um, what fodder and grain they may look to sort of forward contract, um, and and those types of things. So then, um, you know, I, I was at Vega last week at our focus farm, and they have just under a year's worth of silage on hand. Um, um, you know, th then, you know, but it, but it was, wasn't was that long ago and and three years fodder was what people required, right? Um, and and so, you know, just having a, yeah, having a sense of, of um, you know, preparing beyond, beyond the short term and, and sort of, the other thing that's kind of useful to get a sense of, and I and I I was looking for some for some nice colours on that map overall is um it, it works for us if somewhere is doing well, right? Um so if there is somewhere that's a food bowl that's gonna be able to grow plenty of grain and and uh you know end up with you know growing plenty of cereal uh haze and things like that you know to to feed the rest of the country um and I, and I guess i'm i'm not seeing that either um necessarily no not but not necessarily however there's been a good example uh in this last season um where uh the forecast was for it to be quite dry along the south grain growing regions but the rainfall even though it was below average it was delivered exactly at the right time and the right amounts to get that growth and and got good growth so that's why this information is never a panacea I, I, everyone here knows that but it's worth repeating um it's it's another piece of the puzzle that helps us to nudge towards uh, let's think about mitigating at least part of that risk um and, and look i mean that uh, my um a family at Kentucky, New South Wales are doing the same thing, asking that question as super fine wool growers. Um, you know, destocking hurts because it takes a long time to get that quality into the bloodlines. And so trying to hang on is is a risky play. But hey, sometimes 
that's how the business model is set up. So, yeah, tough decisions ahead. Anyone else care to reflect on the um, decisions that might be made in their regions? Thanks for that, Paul. Really appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, it's Jenny Wilson. I'm based in Northern Victoria, regional manager in the Murray uh, region. Um, I think it, it is to Paul's point. It's that acknowledgement that um, are there any regions that potentially will be a, a fodder source or a mm. feedback source uh, for us over the next uh, year or two? Um, uh, being in, in the in an irrigation uh, district. Uh, does have some benefits for the first year. It'll be the second and third year that uh, could be quite problematic and um, potentially exacerbated, depending on what happens with current legislation at the moment as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I think for me it's just about getting that overall picture of um, are we going to have the ability to rely on some of the other regions uh, to to source fodder or what other regions are likely to be dragging fodder out of uh, other, other states uh, to supply their needs. And we're probably seeing a bit of that already with a bit of fodder heading north at the moment. So Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, look, it's beneficial from, from all of those things. But I think the key message really for, for all of us or for, for any dairy farmer is to conserve as much as you can, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not in the business of making those suggestions, the agronomic suggestions, um, but I'm trying to give as much info as I can so that those can be made. Um, and you know, I've just, while you've been speaking there, I was just doing a double check of the unusually wet um, forecast just to see well, where, where it might be the glimmers of hope. There's not a lot. There's not a lot there. Um, so if anyone's interested, I'll um, I'll throw that link in the chat as well. And just to to hark back to Alyssa's point, these are the ones that were developed in the Faunas for Armed. Dairy um, Australia was actively involved. Thanks, Alistair. Um, Verity Ingham, GM of Regional Services at Dairy Australia. I uh, just wanted to provide input mainly to our team in terms of our response effort around um, dry seasons, El Nino. Um, two components of that. One is around um, the DNE aspect, so we're kicking off working group around that. I know some regions are all, already putting out comms and doing work about that. For John, do what you need to there, um, and we'll pull that working group that cross-functional working group together to build up those DNA resources that we're going to need to flow through, obviously, immediately, but in the short, medium and long term. Um, and then also LT will discuss around kicking off a broader issues management framework. So Rachel linking, Rachel Jones linking into you in terms of that dry season, drought, El Nino response, um, bringing in all the factors rather than just the DNA aspect. So I'll say you just wanted to update everyone around that. That's great. Thanks, Verity. I, look, I think um, we, we are coming to time now, so I'll hand back to Rach Jones. But just as a as a last little reminder, um, if you if you do come across folk who are talking um, uh, in terms of El Nino, um, just remind them that it's not the be all and end all. And I, th I think there's been a lot of people getting quite stressed about why hasn't the Bureau announced El Nino yet? The rest of the world has. It actually doesn't matter. Look at the outlook. It's got better information for the decision making. So I think hopefully that'll at least bring a bit of comfort into the decisions that are being made. While they're tough decisions, having uh, confusion in and amongst making a tough decision makes it a lot harder and the decisions get worse. There's um, plenty of evidence for that. So everything we can do to make that a little bit clearer in terms of, yes, this is a hard decision, but the information's fairly solid for you. Um, I just encourage everyone to keep that in mind. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're always here, agriculture at bomb.gov.au, and um, uh, I'll hand back to Rach Jones. 
Thanks, Alistair and uh, Rach Davis. Um, thank you. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your time with us today. Um, some pretty grim numbers, um, as as Paul and, and Jenny mentioned, but um, certainly really appreciate the insights that you've been able to provide. Um, and uh, for everyone, um, thank you for your time as well, everyone who was able to join. I will put the recording up on Dairy Hub. I'll also include the links uh, that have been put into the chat. I'll pop that into the uh, corresponding article on Dairy Hub as well. Uh, so if if you have people in your teams that uh, haven't been able to attend today, um, tell them to keep an eye on, on Dairy Hub and um, they'll be able to watch this recording at their convenience.